All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Best Self Blueprint. So the mission of this podcast is to bring on people who I believe have the experience, knowledge, and insights as to what it takes to truly move the dial towards becoming the best version of yourself. So this guest's story of transformation begins in a place known and feared by many, the fixed mindset. He was a little unhealthy, unhappy with the lifestyle choices he was making, and knew something had to change. Now, thanks to his dedication to learning, his devotion to self-study, and his determination to live a life of impact, he has a job at a company that both pushes him to grow and improves the lives of the millions of people it impacts. His journey from a fixed to growth mindset, his many conversations with some of the world's most influential individuals, and the insane amount of books he's read will surely lead to a conversation you'll all get some powerful lessons from. So to officially introduce him, Chase, how you doing? Hey, Trevor. Thank you so much for having me on. That was a fantastic intro. Well, I do what I can. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. So you're the first person I've had on the podcast who I've never met previous before sitting down. Um, but I have obviously, I first heard your name through the podcast that you you work on, you help develop. And I dove into kind of your story, your history, and I'm excited to get into that. So where I want to start is with your story and more particularly your transition from the fixed mindset to the growth mindset. What was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back that caused the change and just diving into that? Yeah, absolutely. So I graduated college back in 2016 with just a very unhealthy lifestyle. I was drinking and partying every weekend. I didn't have any skills that were sort of marketable to the working force at the time. And I was just looking at myself and reflecting about how uh, how I can be sort of valuable to companies I wanted to go after. And I knew that the current place I was in, where I was at, that I would not be anywhere near uh, at all marketable. So what I did was, is I, I said, I need to make a change. At this point in my life, if I'm going to be down this path, I will be miserable by the time I'm 30 with a job I hate and I'll have a drinking problem on top of it. So I started getting really disciplined in the spring of 2016. So I started lifting weights, I started reading, I actually started off with like Zen Buddhism. So I really got into like that sort of aspect of uh, meditation and whatnot. And I even went to see the Dalai Lama when he was here in uh, Long Beach uh, in, in California. So I was like very much into that space. And I was just really starting to have so much fun in developing sort of the person I wanted to become. I was learning, I was starting to feel confident, I was feeling good. I was going to interviews with Tom at Inside Quest back in he, when he was filming, which is before I was first introduced to him. And it was just so much fun being able to learn and being able to sort of put the shadow of my former self behind me and start building into the person I knew I wanted to become. I had the vision of who I wanted to be, the person who had the skills, who was able to execute on the things he wanted to do in life. And at the point, I had nowhere to go and I had no sort of skills. So it was really just a grind of shame, uh, a feeling of defeat that really just set me off to a course of, I know I can do better than this and I need to do better than this. Yeah. And so do you think it was more fear of staying who you were or was it more a drive and like a pursuit of going towards something? I think it's a mixture of both, to be honest, because if it's just a fear of where I'm at, then I'm operating off, off one sort of variable. So I think to, uh, humans have a sort of innate ability to move towards pleasure and move away from pain. Every option you do in life is either is one of those two things. So a lot of it was moving away from the pain of who I was and who I was going to become on that certain path. And also it felt good moving towards a person I really wanted to become. Yeah. And the, the cool spiral effect of when you really start to make those changes is when they become visible and tangible. Um, then that really is where you, you can see the path because yeah. obviously visualization comes into play. You can envision it, but when you can actually see the result, I think that's where it almost is like, all right, game on. Now I really am going to go for it. So yeah, exactly. Um, diving into a certain aspect of that, you were talking about, you were, you were almost like mentally and emotionally suffering. One quote I absolutely love that you have, or that you, uh, 
are the middleman for. I'm not sure if you came up with it or if you heard it somewhere, but leverage suffering as a tool for self-development. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I think it's more of a, I, I'm, I can't claim that quote. It's more of a, a Goggins sort of quote, David Goggins, if you guys haven't heard of him, but uh, through, I, I have this poster in my room. It says strength is in, is in the struggle. So when it comes to leveraging suffering to sort of achieving your goals, you're going to have to do hard shit. So uh, when Ray Dalio came in to interview his whole, uh, he's the co-founder of Bridgewater or founder of Bridgewater Investments, world's largest hedge fund, a guy I really admire. He said that basically to succeed in human life, you should basically do the opposite of what you really want to do, which basically means you got to do very hard things, things you don't want to do. So when it comes to working out in the mornings, I don't want to work out in the mornings. It's considered suffering for me. But in order to achieve my goals, I know I have to literally push through that suffering to get to that goals. So to me, when it says when you're suffering for sort of achievement, it's not necessarily that you have to go through a specific pain. It's more of a, it's a mental game. It's all mental. You have to push through to become something that you weren't before. And that's, that's how I operate on most things. Like if I have sort of a reflex of, uh, I don't want to do that. It's kind of a habit loop trigger now that I probably should do that. Yeah. And that reminds me of ironically, another David Goggins saying of callousing the mind. I think that's where doing those hard things that you don't want to do for me, it's cold showers. I <laughs> struggle so hard turning that dial, especially because I go in when it's warm. So that way it makes it even tougher. Yeah. But I, I like that you're, you're talking about a, yes, you have to do hard things to get where you want to get. If you have big goals, but also I feel like that's important to get that mental toughness. And I think, I guess that ties into willpower as well. Um, when did you really start to see that shift? Because you had, you had the initial uh, decision of like, all right, I need to make a change. But when did you start hitting that point of like, okay, these are habits now. It's something I know I can do. Was that gradual or did you hit a point of like, wow, I'm actually in stride? Yeah, it's definitely a, a gradual climb for me. Uh, I still struggle every day to you know get these habits in line, and it's not like it's not easy. Like taking cold showers every day isn't something you look forward to, but you know you got to do it because it helps. Again, like you said, callous the mind. So uh, working with Tom for the first few months, like I was super inspired to do like everything that Tom did, like wake up early, get to the office early, read all the books, and pitch them to Tom. Like it, it was it was a fun time, but. Uh, Part, it wasn't just sustainable for me at the time because I was still struggling with other aspects of my life because I was still working out. I still had to figure out a way to make money. So it was uh, it was a gradual climb to learn to build those habits. And uh, I, I still struggle to this day. So it's not ever, and it's not a finished journey. So it's uh, again, gradual. I continually work on it. I really don't think there's an end anyways uh, when it comes to that as well. So I don't think there's ever going to be an end point where it's like, yes, I finally have nailed down these habits. I don't have to worry about it anymore. What makes morning people, morning people is not that they enjoy waking up. It's because that they have the mental willpower to be able to pull through it and be disciplined enough to do that every morning. It's not because they like it, but they know how it benefits them. And that's the point I want to make the most is that like, it never gets easier. I spoke to Tom a few weeks ago and with all the success he has, and all the accolades and whatnot and all the fame, which he doesn't really give, care about too much. But uh, he says that like every day, like seven times a day, he goes from feeling like the king of the world to like, I got so much work to do, like feeling bottom of the barrel. He goes back and forth with those same swings. And I know we all sort of go through that as well. Like you can go in the same shower and feel like you're the man and then talk yourself into feeling like a piece of shit. So I, uh, you know, it's something that is continually worked on no matter how high you climb in the hierarchy. Yeah. I think that's almost what makes it better though, is I always think about like a video game. So I'm, I'm not a gamer by any means, but I played the like little kid games of Pokemon and Spyro the Dragon and all that. And you hit a point yeah. where if, if you're good enough that everything is easy, the game gets boring and you stop playing it. And so I think the pursuit is what yeah. makes life so fascinating and it it makes you get up again because even if you're at a point where yeah you feel like you have the habits nailed down you still feel like there's more to do or more to prove to yourself and i think that's really at least in my opinion where that drive comes from 
is the pursuit of it. Oh, absolutely. Now, let's say because there are a lot of people who are currently in the position you were in upon graduation where they not only have a fixed mindset, but again, are just unhealthy, unhappy, unsatisfied. What are a few tactics or habits that you would advise those people to start with to start kind of flipping the script? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, I've found that a lot of people just kind of go through robots throughout their lives and they kind of just kind of follow what everyone else is doing and don't really take too much consideration in what they actually like and what kind of person they are and what they don't like. They just kind of know that, you know, their friends go out on Saturdays and Sundays that they should probably do the same and that their friends work at sort of a start recruiting firm and spend their money going out to brunch and stuff, but they should do the same thing. Uh, so sort of like what I would do is I would just audit what you like and what you don't like, but more specifically, like figure out what you don't like doing because that'll just weed out uh, a lot of the riffraff. So that was the first thing I did. Like, I did not want to work at a corporation where I was just kind of climbing up the corporate, rat, cor corporate ladder. I wanted to uh, work at a startup because I knew I wanted to make an impact. I wanted to have something with my sort of name on it. I wanted to help build something. I like building things. And I wanted to go with a startup. So I weeded out everything that wasn't a startup. So that narrowed down my options to, you know, maybe 20 or 30 companies that I was able to go to. So that was the first thing I did. And then the second thing I did was I had a picture in my mind and I wrote down the person I wanted to become by the time I was 30. So I had a vision in my mind of like this cool dad with like six pack abs, like a hot wife, like cool kids and like the cool house, big cars. Obviously it's, uh, you know, I'm 26 now and that's four years away. It doesn't seem like I'm on that path, but like that vision in my head is so burned in that the path that I was on wasn't a path that I would be able to achieve that vision. So all right, what do I have to do to achieve that vision? All right, I got to start working out more. I got to get in the habit of working out. Uh, what, I, what else do I have to do? I have to get more money. I have to create some finances. All right, I got to get a job. I got But I want to enjoy my life as well. So I want to work at a place that I really enjoy. So working backwards from those two things, from uh, having the vision of yourself and then also you know, figuring out what you don't want to do. Those are very two powerful places to start. Yeah. Well, and going a little deeper into what you said too, about like at 30, you want to be this person and you said it perfectly. Don't only picture who you want to be. Think about what do you have to do to be the person you want to be? Because I think a lot of people picture that person, but then they don't go that step further of, okay, practically speaking, what do I have to do if that is my goal? It's not just a dream. It's who I want to be. So I think that's really important. But also part of auditing, I think a really powerful tool for that is, let's say, take a week to do that audit of when you go to work, when you go throughout your day, hang out with the people you hang out with, do the you know wind down activities you do. Think about how you feel after you're done doing the thing. And I think that's something, again, we just don't think. So for example, I'm uh, currently reading Jay Shetty's book, Think Like a Monk. And he talks about, we think about if we try a new dish of food, immediately we have an opinion of, okay, I liked that. I didn't like that. Here's what I liked. Here's what I didn't. And yet we don't do that with our own lives and the things that we spend our time doing. Right. And so I, I like that you brought that up. I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Like Jay is very influential person. Like I've gotten many chances to speak and hang out with Jay and he's just full of wisdom. Yeah. So we're going to dive into that because there have been a few for people who know these people, these are some big names that have been talked about just through like things that we've been taught by these people or conversations you've had. So give people a little detail of, you know, what you do for your job and then talk about based on the conversations you get to have with those people, how that's impacted your life and how you go about how you do things. Yeah. So uh, let me start from the beginning. I, I started as an intern unpaid in April of 2017 for Impact Theory when there were seven employees. So I was the first full-time intern at the time. And that was coming up on four years ago. So now I am the lead data analyst for the company. So I help inform business strategy for all aspects of the company when it comes to impact theory, the show, health theory, Lisa's show, women of impact for the impact theory university that we launched last year to uh, our comic side. So I 
dive into data for all of our platforms and I inform strategies, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, uh, trends that we should be hopping on, that kind of stuff. And to me, that's it's, it's really fun because I'm able to just kind of dive into every area of the business and sort of, you know, give my two cents based on the data. So I do a lot of sort of anal analytics analysis, a lot of spreadsheets. So I really enjoy that side of the company. But like you said, like one of the big perks of the company or being a part of it is that I'm also introduced to all of these different uh, influencers and people who come in for interviews. And it's great because I can sit right next to them and listen to interviews, hear the conversations. And sometimes they come hang out a few weeks later to give some advice and whatnot. And to be honest, like I was so confused when I first uh, started working at Impact Theory because to me, like having like millions and millions of dollars was like the ultimate goal for sort of happiness and a success in life. At least that's how, that's how I was conditioned to, uh, well, I was conditioned to learn. And when I saw all these different guests come in who were, they started these billion dollar businesses and they have hundreds of millions of dollars, they're billionaires, they're making tens of millions a year. I was so confused about how, why they were still doing what they were doing. Why are you still doing interviews? Why are you still working till 4 a.m.? You already made it. You have the private jet. You have the Rolls Royce. You have the Bentley. What the hell are you still doing? Like, take a take a breather. And uh, that was probably my biggest mistake that I assumed about these people, which I'm so grateful to learn from them now because they're able to have these great mindsets and also have this sort of financial freedom. And they're wanting to give back to uh, the people as well, which is why they're doing the show. So it's like, these people truly do have a heart of gold. And now that really opened me up to like, it's not just about the financial success, like do good, be a good person. Um, you can't guarantee the finances will obviously come, but like, it's still a great strategy in life. Like karma is a, a, an interesting thing. Like if you do good things for people, good things happen to you. Like that's a great strategy. So I was just really like influenced by just the sort of warmth and kind heartedness that some of these people were that showed uh, impact theory, the studio, uh, they showed the guests who viewed the videos, the follow-up videos, like they're just inspiring people all around. And I'm so grateful to, so to be red pilled by the idea that money isn't the end goal. Yeah. So talk about, I, I know, uh, Tom is huge on the matrix. I actually didn't see that movie until maybe two years ago. My friend freaked out when he heard, I hadn't heard it. So he went through <laughs> the whole series and it really is a powerful message when you, when you get down to the red pill, blue pill. So talk about that. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have seen the movie, but the way you just used it, where you got red pilled by these people, explain that a little bit. Yeah. So red pill to me is a sort of a synonym for like a truth bomb, like an assumption you had about the world or a belief that just totally gets blown up in your face. And the whole, the whole world is a different shade of gray. So to me, like that's happened a few times and that's just one example, but, uh, you know, many people got red pilled through 2020 when they realized that, you know, no one really knows what they're doing when it comes to sort of like politics and the election and sort of what's happening with the coronavirus, like nothing's really consistent. So it's like the red pill that's hitting a lot of people is like, you know, we can't really trust in the institutions we used to trust. So that, that, that's a red pill. And to be honest, I haven't seen the matrix uh, I, I didn't see the matrix first, uh, first time until I started working at impact theory. So it was a new concept to me as well. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a good one. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. Now I'm curious because you've had, again, a lot of really powerful conversations with really influential people. What's, and I'm sure there's not a top one. There's a lot of different top ones, but if you could pick the number one takeaway you've gotten from a direct conversation with one of these people who was it that you think stands out to you and what was it that they they advised you or talked to you about such a good question so first off it has to be tom billion number one he's, he's my boss he's one of my really good friends on a personal side and i've gotten i've been lucky to spend three and a half years with them uh face to face and not excluding this, excluding this year, but uh, we've had so many great conversations. Uh, we have this thing called fireside chats. We do every Thursday over Zoom, and we do them every now and then at the at the office uh, when it was just like after work. We're all tired. Tom will just sit at his table. We'd all just sit around and just 
chat about life, questions, business. So I, Tom's time, his graciousness, Lisa's time, her graciousness to be able to sit in and help sort of mentor us young people in like questions we have about life and assumptions about work, like that is worth its weight in gold. And to me is priceless. Like every conversation I have with them is, uh, my, is, is always a good time and I get so much out of it. And so they would be my number one answer. But to answer your question specifically, let's see. Uh, Brandon Burchard has come in and talked a few times. He's been very impactful, but uh, I'm trying to think of someone who came in with like sort of a punch. The thing is when people come in for these conversations, it's more of just like to consult for sort of business questions we have. So we have like guys like Jay Shetty come in, Brandon Burchard, and a few other people come in to talk, but it's not really like about life altering conversations, more of just business strategy. Cause these guys are also like great mindset experts, but they're also whip it smart in business. And when they know something that we don't, uh, we ask them and they sort of are so gracious enough to help out. And, uh, those have been the conversations we've had mostly, but, uh, yeah, I can't think of one specific lightning bolt moment. They've all just been sort of, you know, combined together. So sorry to be a bummer, but <laughs> Hey, no, that's fine. And I, I think, this is a good point to mention. The reason he can't think of one lightning bolt is because impact theory, every episode is full of thunderstorms, if you will. It's just great point after great point and great life lesson after great life lesson. If you haven't heard of it, definitely check it out. It's one of the things that inspired me to even start this in the first place. But I want to dive into you. Were, you kind of lit up when you talked about like Tom and Lisa and it especially when you were talking about just their kindness and who they are as people. One of the talks I found that you did, it was a really brief talk on YouTube. I, it might've been on a podcast. You talked about evaluating relationships and determining, you know, whether or not the person is helping you grow and reach your goals and whether you're doing the same for that person. Talk about evaluating relationships in your life. Like, how you've done it, how it served you, and just what tips you have for people. Yeah. Uh, one of the great things about impact theory is that I'm able to build relationships with a lot of these people that we work with. And like, to me, that's my, my favorite part of it. I love being the person who's able to give value to these people and have them, you know, win. So I love seeing people win. So I, I consulted for a few people on like YouTube strategies and whatnot, and the things I'm seeing and I see them win on the YouTube and that makes me feel just awesome. And that when the selfish desire of me feeling awesome and them benefiting, like is what is the key to making it work? Like when selfish desires align, beautiful things happen. They get help. I get that cool. I get a new relationship feeling, which I like. And to me, that's what it's all about. Right. So like, like Tom says, money spends once, but relations tip relationships spend forever. So I'm much more keen on creating these relationships than I am getting a sort of a commission from whatever I'm doing. And to me, that just, it just goes to show that like your network is your, is your net worth. So it's all about basically who, you know, and how you can help them and how they can help you. And that to me is something that I value a lot. And uh, when it comes to people building it, building those with other people, just do your best to add value, add value, add value. I was on another podcast where they were asking about sort of brand consulting and how do I create a bigger brand on Instagram or email. And I'm just like, you need to add value, give it away for free. Don't charge immediately, give everything you have and put it out on the table and people will start, will start coming. They'll start drinking in the knowledge. And then you can figure out later a, a way later to figure that out. But first off, just add value. There's so many case studies out there like Tom's and there's a podcast called mind pump who uh, they're three trainers. All they do is they go on they go on their podcast and they give out free fitness knowledge for the first three years. And that's all they did. And now they're making a lot of money and revenue, but all but their whole strategy was just give it out for free. Let people come in, join the ecosystem. So when it comes to building relationships, add value. If you want to reach out to someone you want to work for as a mentor, figure out a way you can add value to them. Don't go to them and say, how can I help you do this? If you kind of study what their business is about, you know them so well, pick apart how you can add value to them and pitch them like, Hey, look, I saw that, you know, you need a data analyst. So I ran through all your sort of numbers I can get a hold of. And I broke down this analysis. And I think if you really start hitting the marks here, you'll be able to sell more here, et cetera. And if you send that to someone in an email or resume, like 
that is way more impactful than, hey, I'm a big fan of yours. How can I help? Let me know how I can help. Because that puts the job back on them. So when it comes to building relationships, just always be sure to add value and uh, don't try to be someone who just takes value. Always be sure to give more than you receive. To me, that, that, that's very big. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I think that transitions into like, not just business relationships, but in your personal relationships with your friend group, are these people who really are adding value to your life? And if not, how much time are you really willing to invest in those people? So when you were transitioning into the lifestyle you have now and the habits you have now, were there people who kind of were an obstacle along that path? No. So that's kind of funny you mentioned that. Uh, I have a very solid group of friends. Like they've been my friends since high school and there have been new friends that came in who I've just been very, very close with. So I haven't had any sort of issues with cutting off friends. Like they've been super supportive of, you know, me going down the mindset space and me sort of going down the health space and like not eating uh, any sort of carbs for a full month and not drinking for a month or whatever. So they haven't given me any shit. They haven't been like abusive or anything. They've been just so gracious and courteous. Like they've, they've been the best friends I could have ever had. So I'm very lucky on that front. Yeah. And I, I think that's important to find people who are cheerleaders in a sense where it's not like you go to your friends, you tell them this big goal that you want and they kind of just are like, Oh, well that's dumb or there's no way you're going to yeah. be able to do that but they cheer you on and maybe even help you out and give you tips if they have them. And I think that's really important to have a group like that, where you do just, you lift each other up, you help each other out. So I'm glad to hear that for you. And I hope other people can take that away as well, that that is so important. Now we're going to transition a little bit. I want to be courteous of your time, but I also want to get all the information. Yeah. So let's talk about books. You read a a crazy amount of books. So I'm curious, have you always been into reading or is that something you adopted when you took on like, this is who I want to be. And then how do you determine like what books you're going to read and just kind of talk about your mindset around that? Yeah. So my, my view on books before college and even during college was like, I have to read of mice and men and write a report about it. Great. I wasn't really much a fan of books. And it wasn't until I sort of like started getting out of college where I was like, all right, I'm going to start this personal development path. My mom's been pushing these books on me. This like Zen and the Art of Happiness was one of the first books that I read that I really enjoyed. But the one book that really nailed it for me was Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. That like, I, I'm that I can't thank that book enough for opening my eyes to like, wow, such powerful information here and so fun to learn. I'm, I love like learning about the human body and evolutionary history. And it was just such a fun book to read that after I finished it, I immediately opened it up, started reading the first chapter again. And I haven't done that with any other book in my life. And it was just a, it showed me that there's so much power in reading and books and getting these ideas in. And that just had me questioning like what other amazing ideas are in other books that I don't know about. And that was another red pill for me. It was like, wow, this reading stuff is pretty awesome. And that sounds crazy to many, but to me, it was uh, sort of a breakthrough. So when I first started getting into books, uh, I just listened to, I would listen to podcasts from people I admired. So Naval Ravikant was on Tim Ferriss back in 2015, and he mentioned like three or four books and one of them happened to be Sapiens. So I started reading Sapiens and then I would listen to Yuval's podcast and he mentioned a few other books that he read, Guns in the, or Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Cook. So I started reading that one and he would read books and it just kind of spirals from there. Plus, Tom's a big reader as well. So he would do podcasts on some of these guests. They'd have books. I'd read their book. And in their book, they'd have other books. And it just kind of spiraled from there. And uh, on my end, I, I also just try to discover new books that also help enrich my business acumen and also could help the business. So one of the books that I pulled was Principles by Ray Dalio. And I, I read that one all the way through. And I was like, Tom, you got to read this book. And that's when I was an intern. So I told, and Tom was like, oh, yeah, I'll read it. Um, and I kept pushing him, Tom, you need to read this book. And he was like, all right, all right, I'll read it. And after like three or four times, he ended up reading it. And it fundamentally changed the way we operate in the company because there's a lot of principles in there that kind of opened Tom's eyes to how to operate the company. And that wouldn't have happened if I didn't read the book, if 
you know, Tom didn't want to read the book as well. So it's like, there's so much knowledge encapsulated in all these books that just need to be cracked open. And if you can find the joy in sort of learning from these books and drinking it and how fun it is to gain and use knowledge, it becomes a fun game to play. So that's exactly why I do it. I read a lot of books on health and nutrition, ketogenic diet, carnivore diet, ancestral diet, primal diets. And it's just fun for me to play around with all that stuff because it helps me optimize my life. Some of them make me feel like shit, but I know exactly what I don't want to eat. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a fun game to play. And it's just, you got to look at it as sort of a, like you said, a video game. Start optimizing, start trying it out. Everybody likes to read. They just don't know what they like to read. Wow. I like that you finished with that statement. <laughs> that is awesome. And another thing too is reading a, yes, it's way better in terms of your education, continued education, your growth, but also it's so much healthier for you to, let's say you get home from work, you've got a couple hours to wind down. If you turn on the TV and you're watching a mindless show, a, you're getting that artificial light. So that's getting input yeah. right before you try to go to bed. And then you're, you're in a restless state because you just had all that artificial light pumping in uh, through your eyes. Reading doesn't have that. It doesn't have that artificial light. It doesn't have that constant visual stimulus, but at the same rate, you're getting so much more out of it. So there's more benefits and less downside. And so I think if people could adopt the habit of even for 10 minutes, just pick up a book, read a few pages and start there, like it did for you, like it did for me, I think it'll completely change their life. So I'm, I'm glad I had you on to talk about that. For me, I'm not great at articulating why people should read books. So I think you did a much better job than I could have. Yeah. And I mean, it comes down to balance as well. Like you're in the fitness space as well. Like how many times have you seen people just crash diet for three weeks and then they, they go ham and then they sort of fall off. It's like finding, finding balance and everything. So uh, I still watch the Netflix shows. I still, you know, have occasional beer too. Uh, so I, I consider that part of like having a healthy lifestyle as well. As crazy as that sounds like there's sort of a mental, spiritual and physical aspect of your life and depriving yourself of the joys of having a piece of cake at your sister's wedding or uh, not having a drink at your uh, birthday party. Like that is all encompassing and part of what we consider a healthy lifestyle. So depriving yourself of that is might become neurotic. So when it comes to reading, take 10 minutes a day. Don't stress yourself over it. If you like it, keep doing it, find more time to do it. If you want to have a beer, don't go over the top, find that balance in your, in your, in your life, you know? Yeah, I completely agree with that. And also I think the best part about indulging in those types of activities is if you're doing your workouts, if you're eating clean, if you're getting the education, if you're building the right relationships, then those rewards don't make you feel bad for doing them because you feel you've gotten to a place where you're good, you're set, you're healthy, you're fit, you're, you're in a good place. You can enjoy a beer. You can enjoy a bag of chips. You can enjoy a movie on Netflix. And I just think that's where people fall off is like you said, they haven't done enough in their mind to earn that reward. And so then when they give themselves that reward and they haven't earned it, they kick themselves for that, which just turns into a, negative feedback loop spiral and yeah, there's nothing more satisfying than putting in a week's worth of like really hard work and then just kicking your feet up on the weekend and saying like i deserve this it's a different feeling than telling yourself you deserve this even though you didn't work it's it's night and day and tom uh every year around christmas this time uh we close the office for two weeks and tom completely checks out no work no phone calls no texts no no emails no nothing and he is able to do that because he knows he puts in so much work throughout the year that he knows that, you know, reward yourself sometimes. And this is his favorite time of the year. So him and Lisa have a good time. So he, Tom does this as well. Yeah. It's, it just goes back to that inner knowing, like as long as you know, in your heart of hearts that you've done what you need to do, enjoy, enjoy the other side of things. So exactly. Yeah. That's, that's huge. All right. So for every guest, I finish off with two questions, but before that, I think there are a lot of people who are into self-development, into just learning about the growth mindset. 
where can people connect with you if they, if they have questions about that stuff, if they have questions about books? I know your Instagram has a whole highlight reel on books. Uh, where can people go to connect with you to learn more about that stuff? Yeah. Follow me on Instagram uh, at Chaycap, C-H-A-Y-C-A-P. Uh, my DMs are wide open and I answer to every single one of them. So hop on in. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. I am proof. I slid into the DMs and I got him on the podcast, <laughs> which I'm very happy I did. I think there was a ton of really good insights, but now it's the finale. So the first question I always ask people is for you right now, what is the biggest obstacle between you and your best self? Wow. Great question. Right now, the biggest obstacle is being consistent with the gym for me because that encompasses uh, mental and the physical aspects. So my gym is closed. So I have this sort of weight set in the corner, but I'm not seeing the results I would get from the heavy weights. So I have to put in more effort with higher reps and higher sets. And that's been very difficult to see results from. And plus uh, my eating hasn't really been super clean. So for me, like getting that habit kicked in and into gear is uh, very key for me. And again, like I yo-yo a lot because I experiment with other diets, but really nailing down sort of the macro levels that I need for different proteins and carbs and fats, I'm still experimenting with. Uh, I haven't found that base rate for me. So I think that's going to be the next big step for me is really nailing that down. Awesome. Well, I'm excited for you to get that figured out. I think that'll be, yeah. I think that'll be good. And then the last thing I ask, this is my favorite part because throughout the whole conversation, there are insights, there's really good tips, tricks, tactics, just a, a good back and forth. But now you get to directly challenge whoever listens to this. So if you could give the listeners one challenge, one thing to do that when completed, it'll either teach them a profound lesson or better them in some way, what would your one challenge to them be? Ooh, that is a great question. Let's see trying to think one of the one of the best things that i've done recently has been taking 10 minute walks three three times a day so for me that helps with digestion after i eat and then two it just gives me a time to think and and breathe a little bit so for me i would challenge you guys for at least a week after you eat take a 10 minute walk and just sort of reflect and think about the things that are really on your mind uh, a, you'll feel better on the digestion standpoint. And two, like all the best ideas that I've had, all the sort of breakthroughs that I've had have come from these sort of the, these walks. So uh, I think Einstein used to do them was where I learned about them from. A lot of people I've found the best ideas I've gotten have just from being quiet and walking. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to live in an area where weather permits, definitely try to take those walks, really reflect on your goals. It will definitely be something of uh, great use. I will say as someone who lives in Wisconsin, there is very rarely an excuse. You have hats, you have gloves, you have jackets. Make it happen. So uh, my promise to you, because if I don't practice what I preach, there's no reason I should be doing this. So I will definitely do that for a week. I usually eat two big meals a day, but after both meals, I'll go out, just take a 10 minute stroll and I'll, I'll let you know kind of what it does for me, because I think that'll be really important for me too. I've I've done like mindfulness practice after eating and even during eating, but I've never done that. And I think that's a really good way for me to switch it up. So yeah, that's, yeah, definitely that's a good one. Have your cold shower sort of uh, exposure at the same time as well. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Just jump Wear in a snow bank. Be good. <laughs> exactly. Well, that is pretty much it for the informational part of this chase. I want to thank you for responding, taking the time, sitting down, but more than that, I want to thank you for paving the path that you did because a lot of people can look up to you as a really good example of how to get out of a negative mindset, how to get out of an unhealthy lifestyle, how to pursue the life they want to live and just living with intention and in service. And I really want to thank you just for being you and doing the things you're doing. Appreciate that, Trevor. Thank you. Uh, I've been struggling with imposter syndrome for a while. And uh, it took me some convincing to sort of get my voice out there. So I've been doing a lot more podcasts like these. So I'm very grateful to share the information and hopefully it impacts somebody who's listening. Oh, I know it will. It already impacted one. So I'm sure it'll <laughs> impact more. All right. For everybody listening, 
this conversation was amazing. If there's anything that you have questions about or just have a comment to share, by all means, comment in the comment section. And if you feel like this is particularly useful for someone else you know, share this episode with them. That's what this is all about, is getting this information to the people who need it most and getting it to as many people as we can. So I think that's all I got for the subscribers. We will see you next time. And thanks for listening.